morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to ARA's Webinar Wednesday program. I'm Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as your moderator for today's webinar entitled Mitigating Explosive Threats at U.S. Airports. Next slide, please. Prior to beginning the program today, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items with you. First of all, if you have an issue with sound and you're using your computer speakers, please dial in using your phone, remembering to disconnect your computer speakers. If you continue to have an issue, then please use the chat button and send a message only to the host and we'll do our very best to help you. Next slide, please. If you have questions, please cl click on the Q&A button and send your question and listen carefully Please send your question to the host and the panelists that will enable us to manage the Q&A program a bit better. So again, send the question to the host and the panelists. We encourage you to send questions through the entire technical program, but we'll defer addressing questions to the conclusion of the technical program at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. To view the presentation in full screen, Go to the top of your webinar settings, click on the down arrow that's at the extreme right, highlight view, and then choose fit the viewer. Just as a reminder that to receive the one hour PDH certificate, you must attend the entire one hour webinar. Additional information will be provided at the conclusion of the presentation. Next slide, please. Finally, before beginning the technical program, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Mr. Kenneth Hurley. Ken is a senior engineer at ARA, and he is a U.S. Air Force Gulf War veteran. He has an impressive curriculum vita. He supported over 20 United States government agencies performing blast vulnerability assessments and design in over 35 states and 15 countries abroad. His, excuse me, his blast analyst and design experience for aviation facilities spans over 35 U.S. commercial airports, included very large hub locations such as San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Minneapolis, Phoenix, and Charlotte. Ken has worked on numerous large explosive tests uh, of building uh, facades and structural systems and served as the National Vice Chair of the U.S. Homeland Security Working Group on Explosive Modeling. Ken is a registered professional engineer in 10 states, including the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico as well. He earns various additional certifications related to protection professional and project management skills. He has an MS degree from Auburn University and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of New Orleans. So it's my great pleasure to turn the program over to Ken. Ken? All right. Thank, thank you, Jerry. Um, I just wanted to start um, with a little background here. Um, I actually started with ARA, uh, ARA one week before uh, sept the September 11, 2001 attacks. And so um, needless to say, I kind of hit the ground running uh, after, that, after that point and uh, spent the next few years flying around the country helping various airports comply with the, uh, the new, well, not necessarily new, but the, the, the more enforced federal requirements that were enacted after the attacks. A little bit of background here. Um, the airports serve a critical role in modern society on, on several fronts. They're also a rich target for mass casualty explosive attack just by nature of their design and their function. Over the past 20 years, uh, much has been done to help provide more secure commercial aviation environments and, and the, the different measures have been incorporated at the federal, state and local levels. In this pre presentation, we're going to, to provide a brief history, the requirements enacted at U.S. airports for mitigating explosive attack over the last 20 years. We're going to explore engineering level approaches for implementing these requirements. And we're going to provide several project examples highlighting these different approaches. An outline of what we are planning to cover here. Uh, the first item is uh, different reasons for protecting airports. 
And then we're going to move into general methods for countering explosive attack. Then we'll move into aviation facilities as explosive attack targets. Then we'll move on to explosive analysis and design requirements for civil aviation facilities. Then we'll move on to blast analysis and design approaches. And finally, the project examples. Okay, one of the big questions is uh, why protect the airports? There, there are a number of different reasons why we should protect the airports. Uh, the, one of the, 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 the first being uh, airports, are, I mean, in no particular order here, but uh, air, airports are prominent. Uh, they're very prominent in, in modern society. They, they serve a political role. They also serve a symbolic role. They are, a lot of these airports are iconic. They're name brands. You can go anywhere and mention some of the names and people automatically know what you're talking about. And they also form a municipal focal point for uh, for, for different municipalities, uh, just uh, city states. Uh, a lot of focus uh, tends to be put on airports for various reasons. And uh, one of, one of the reasons is, I mean, when we're seeing it now, is they they serve they can serve as an emergency hub in times of crisis and for relief efforts and stuff. We saw this in Hurricane Katrina with the New Orleans uh, International Airport. And we're seeing it now in uh, Kabul, Afghanistan, where uh, all eyes focus, everything kind of gravitates to airports in, in times of crisis for uh, for help and, and response. There's um, there, there's a, a, a quote I recall here, hearing that I, that I thought was kind of relevant uh, to this. Is uh, the quote goes that in, in, a, in a disaster, an airport can substitute for almost anything else, but nothing can substitute for an airport. And uh, that, that I believe came from one of the administrators at uh, Memphis years ago. Airports are vulnerable. Uh, the flying public, they, they like open and inviting facilities. Uh, that, that's what, what they're accustomed to. That's what they're, they're seeking. So it, it, just by nature of, of, of the airports, um, uh, you, you know, people are vulnerable, facilities are vulnerable, infrastructure and operations are vulnerable. Airports are also large economic drivers for these cities uh, via the passenger traffic, uh, ticket sales, air cargo, parking. Parking doesn't get a lot of attention, but parking is can be a large revenue generator for, for many airports. And after September 11th, a lot of airports spent quite a bit of uh, funding uh, upgrading airports to get a, to regain a lot of their parking that they lost due to the, uh, the enacted federal requirements. Because it, it was just uh, the, the parking revenue was, was such a large amount that they, they had had to um, get, get a lot of that back as much as they could. Um, looking at concessions and vendors, um, advertisers uh, also uh, can contribute to, to, as an economic driver. And also these airports, uh, especially really large ones, serve as the gateways to, to the cities that they serve. And, and they can uh, they can actually be a determining factor for business relocation. I, I know you know over the years I've seen where you know some large corporations are looking to to relocate headquarters or establish new operation centers and such. And, and the airport actually plays a large role in in the selection process. And also too, uh, looking at selection for uh, large special events and and lots of attendees um, participating. And, and also, uh, the airports are part of a nationwide uh, network, the National Airspace System. Uh, the National Airspace System, uh, often referred to just the NAS, it, 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 there are various components to them, airports being what one of the components, also you have facilities, navigation facilities, airspace, uh, information, regulations, manpower, materials, lots of things uh, incorporate uh, or, or comprise the National Airspace System. But along with that, you have these interdependencies, and if these interdependencies, if, if there's a disruption, then you get cascading effects. And in some of these major nodes, downtime of just a few hours can have cascading impacts across the national airspace system. Okay, we're going to go ahead and look at the general methods for countering explosive attack. Uh, there, there are essentially three primary levels here. The first one is intelligence. Intelligence, uh, you probably read about it in the news, uh, they, they work behind the scenes identifying and disrupting attack during the planning stage. Uh, they, thankfully, it, most attacks, most attack plots are foiled uh, during the intelligence phase. That, that, that's something that's really ramped up since uh, the September 11th attack. Big emphasis put on, on intelligence, uh, lot, lots going on in, in that area. Uh, security operations. 
Um, they, they, it's one of the, the roles that they, or that the operations play in this is they're an attack deterrent. Um, if somebody, if a group or an individual is doing pre-op surveillance and, and they, they see uh, uh, really robust security operations, they may say, oh, this is going to be too difficult to pull off, I'll, I'll, I'll go elsewhere. And then uh, security operations also dis can disrupt an attack prior to execution. Um, it would be a, a, essentially two means, either spotting abnormal or unusual activity uh, occurring in and around the airport or also through routine or random checks uh, at or, or near the airport. And then we have hardening, which we're going to focus on here. And hardening essentially the last line, it's the last line of defense once an attack has occurred. Um, it's, it's essentially, okay, it, 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 the, the, the perpetrator got through the intelligence, they got through security operations, now, now hard, hardening is essentially what's going to uh, mitigate whatever damage they're, they're trying to inflict. Okay, we're going to look at here aviation facilities as explosive attack targets. One of the, the first things people think about are airport terminals. Um, that, that, that's where people spend most of their time, that's what they're most familiar with. Um, if, if for these, we have um, it, two different types of threats, it, external threats, which are threats located outside of the terminal, and then internal threats, uh, threats, uh, explosive threats located inside the terminal. And we have fuel farms and uh, passenger mass, mass transit systems, and we also have air traffic control. Uh, consisting of air traffic control towers, air traffic control tower base buildings, and then the air route traffic control centers. And uh, we, we've actually worked on, on all of these here on this list over, over time. And, and, and they're all critical to, to keeping everything in operation and, and keeping people safe. Aviation facilities as an explosive attack. We also have a history of explosive attack on airports. Um, and many of these attacks uh, have uh, occurred overseas. Uh, there have been a few attempts made in the U.S. Uh, the more recent ones in 2007 at JFK Airport, there was a failed bombing of fuel infrastructure. And in 2013, uh, Mid-Continent, Wichita Mid-Continent Airport, there was a failed suicide bombing. Um, we actually, we did the blast assessment uh, prior to that, and I actually did the same survey for that one. And so we were surprised when we saw that one in, 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 the, in, in the news. Um, and they're, they're also, even with everything going on um, in, in terms of intelligence and stuff, there are still explosive threats uh, that are with us, uh, as evidenced by the Nashville downtown bombing um, uh, late last year. Looking at uh, explosive analysis and design requirements for civil aviation infrastructure. Looking at uh, it, design requirements for the airport terminal, and this is specifically for, for, for the terminal. Uh, prior to uh, September 11, 2001, the FAA uh, had the SDA 3 requirement, which was a 300 foot roll. It, it, this was actually developed in the 1990s. And uh, the 300 foot rule, uh, the 300 foot standoff came out of our office here. Um, we, we had gotten a call. I, I wasn't here at the time. We, we have so uh, both of our engineers who worked this are, are still here. Um, and and we, we received a call here at the office of FAA, from FAA identifying the specific quantity of, of explosives that had been reported stolen with the belief that they, they, they were targeted for an FAA facility. So our, our engineers here did some quick back of the envelope calculations. They needed a response right away and said, okay, based on the information we have and what you were able to provide, we feel 300 foot will, will be uh, sufficient. So 300 foot uh, it kind of it made it into the document and, and it, it stayed in, in the SA3 requirement. After September 11th, um, it, 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 it the government officials were looking at, uh, okay, what can we put out there immediately? And so they pulled up the, the SA3 document with the 300 foot rule. And, um, and so for several years after September 11th, the SCA3 was the, 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 the guiding requirement for airports. But and over time, uh, DHS was spun up and then TSA and then, and then uh, through TSA, the, there was the, the BIP uh, SOP requirement was developed, which defined blast envelopes around the, the airports for, for four different threat sizes. And the standoff was then shifted back to the, the response of the terminal um, uh, uh, for the four threat sizes and the specific standoff that correlated with them. 
and um, it, it, uh, it uh, the BIP stands for Bomb Incident Prevention Plan, and then it was later changed to Bomb Incident Protection Plan, uh, realizing that uh, you're not going to prevent an explosive attack, but you can uh, protect from it. And then, and then, so during this process, this transition, all the responsibility kind of shifted from FAA uh, to TSA for this, but FAA still made control, they remain in control of, of their own facilities. At this later transition uh, several years ago to a, a risk analysis process, which is a facility specific process, and and this is a trend in the, in the uh, within the security within security and, and some other areas too, where they're going to a largely risk based approach to where they're, they're getting away from from prescriptive measures and more towards uh, specific. Um, uh, conditions at, at each site because it, it's like it, one, one size doesn't necessarily fit all. I remember after September 11th when we were flying around doing these for the airports, we, we did an assessment for an airport. Uh, it was in a, in, a, in a small, fairly, it was a still, it was a commercial airport. They had two flights a day, one in the morning and one, one in the afternoon. And 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 it was just a, a small uh, commercial turboprop plane. And while we were there doing the site survey, the, the afternoon flight arrived, and, and there was one passenger that, that boarded. And so, and everybody was wondering why why, why are we having to comply with this? I don't think we're at the same level as some of these other airports. So, but uh, so so that's kind of where the the, the risk approach comes in. But it, you know, with, with with risk, I mean, it's 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 good because it targets it to to the specifics of the state or location or assets you're trying to protect. But at the same time, the, it, you know, the risk analysis, it's uh, in the risk documents, it's a living document and should be continually updated. Uh, you know, often maybe once a year or so. And if you're designing based off a of risk analysis, uh, if the threat environment changes uh, somewhere down the line, um, it's a, essentially it's a snapshot in time. So you may have to go back and do some other measures if, if the threat increases drastically for, for some reason um, to, to, to make up the difference there. And then looking at FAA infrastructure, um, we, we, FAA uh, follows uh, 1,669C physical security requirements, and uh, we, we, we actually worked with FAA to, to develop this for the, the actually the blast design and assessment requirements. Uh, the, the original 1,669C and all subsequent updates, uh, we, we worked with them to develop, and this applies to air traffic control towers, air traffic control tower base buildings, and, and erupt, erupt traffic control centers. Look at basic variables and blast analysis and design. The first item that we typically look at, you look at the explosive threat charge size. How large is the threat? Um, you, you have vehicle threats, you have backpack threats, you have all, all different you know, types of sizes when you're doing general uh, blast analysis, especially when you're you know, going to a risk-based approach. It's, it, like I said, it's going to be uh, more uh, facility specific. And then looking at explosives for threat standoff, how far away is the, the threat from the facility? Uh, ideally, you'll, you'll, you'll want to get as far away as possible, um, it's just because that, that's where you get essentially your biggest bang for your buck is, is, is through standoff. Um, sometimes when you're dealing with existing facilities and different sites, you, you're, you're kind of landlocked or, or have other uh, surrounding issues or, or surrounding uh, uh, the, you know perimeter restrictions that you're dealing with, and so you you, you have to work around that and then design accordingly. And then uh, we're looking at hardening of the facility, and those are largely the three different variables: uh, the charge size, the standoff, and the facility hardening. And the facility hardening essentially ties back to the accept acceptable level of risk, where your performance criteria are selected to match the acceptable level of risk for the facility. Looking at building components for blast analysis and design. Your, the primary uh, design objectives, uh, the, the first one is to el limit injuries to, to people. Uh, in, in blast uh, events, the, the top two cases of casualties and fatalities in occupied facilities are collapsing structure and hazardous uh, window breakage in, in that order. So those are the, the two that uh, are focused on most. Uh, if you can control those two, you generally have a, a pretty good outcome in terms of um, 
of uh, it, it minimizing injuries to people within the facility. And then you design to limit the extent of damage to the facility. The, the key word in both of these is, is limit, because you're not going to achieve a, a, a totally bomb proof facility. Um, largely, you, you, for, for two reasons. One is that nobody really wants to, very, very few organizations would spend the money to try and, 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 uh, and do that. Uh, you know, largely those are, you know, some, sometimes like emergency operations centers and, and things like that, command centers will command and control what would require operate through conditions. And so and on those facilities, you know, spend the, the, the extra money to, to make sure those things can remain fully functional uh, during an event. Um, we actually did, um, it designed some other facilities elsewhere in the world uh, for that type of condition, and and, uh, and and there's a hefty price that comes along with them. And then secondly, is uh, somebody can always bring a, a bigger bomb than what you designed for. I mean, it, it, uh, to some of these, the, the, essentially the, the the threats are are, are based off of precedent, um, and and it, it's. Um, it, 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 it can be smaller or larger um, based on the um, on, on, on it, 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 essentially no one knows what, what somebody's going to try and use to bomb a facility. So you can design for a, a specific charge size, but in the end, somebody can always bring something bigger. And then they, these are the types of facility uh, uh, components, anyway, that we that, that we look at uh, in in design of these facilities: uh, wall systems, window systems, skylights, roof systems, primary structural members, and then also project dependent, depending on uh, requirements. For some require they also require doors and, and louvers. And then you can see the the illustration to the right. Uh, just kind of identifies just some general and you know when doing these we we, we, we dig down more into the details than, than, than what's shown here but this is just provided for general illustration and also historically uh, cast in place concrete has been used in for for, for blast resistant design uh, but o over time um, advancements have 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 come a long way in design and detail and so you can get uh, acceptable performance for many types of uh, out of many types of commercial construction materials uh, that you know decades ago no one really thought possible, and that's just due to, to, to it, just different approaches, di different analysis methods, improvement in material strengths and such. So you, you can design some pretty nice uh, facilities, some very nice looking facilities that that are. are, are have a blast resistance built in, but you, you would never know it from, from looking at them. Uh, we, we kind of moved away from the, the, the back of the look. And so yeah, there, there's some really nice, some really uh, very architecturally pleasing uh, facilities out there that are hard to blast. Okay, looking at uh, analysis of different components for blast, and then these are ordered from simple to complex. Um, the first is, is lookup charts. Uh, these these are really simple. You basically look up, you know, they, they have their different types, but you, um, you, you know, look up. Okay, what you know, where's what, what's what's my my blast load or charge weight and standoff and stuff, and and what's my component span or, and stuff, and just look it up in a table. Um, yeah, they're, 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 those are very simple. And then you have pressure and impulse curves, which are developed based around um, the specific components or, or different specific systems. Then you have single degree of freedom approaches, um, which which you, you actually can, can get some pretty pretty uh, detailed uh, and useful information out of it for for detailing designs. And then uh, finite element analysis. And uh, typically, the final two, SDOF and FEA, are, are, are mostly what's used in design. All four can be used as assessment tools, uh, the, the, but as you get farther down, they, that, can, they, they, that gets you more into the design tool realm. And, and looking at these structural components, of the, the structural response are typically evaluated in terms of ductility and rotation. Uh, ductility is is like, say, you have a clothes hanger and you bend it a little bit and it pops back into place, and then you bend it some more and it stays bent. It, you've essentially exceeded your elastic limit and gone into plastic. Uh, 
um, deformation on that, and so so that's what the the, the ductility is, is based on. That it's just the the um, the, 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 the proportion of, of uh, have you exceeded your, your elastic limit, and if so, by how much? And then your rotation, um, how much how much rotation do you have? How, how much deflection do you have? And, and, and uh, so some elements you can push really far. You can get a lot of rota rotation about. Um, but for example, if you have a column, you don't want a lot of rotation on the column because you, once you once you get too far beyond, you're 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 you're, you're going to have problems. Okay, looking at internal versus external threats, external explosive threats. We have uh, vehicle delivered explosive threats parked outside the facility. We're looking at vehicle standoff, like we discussed, how far. Um, and when? Uh, how far? It, essentially, it, like I, I mentioned, stand standoff is your most impactful uh, tool you have in, in blast mitigation. The farther you can get the threat away from the target, the, the better, because uh, blast waves, they, they are, or blast loads anyway, they're 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 exponential. They're not linear. And so every additional foot you can get, especially when you get close in, every additional foot you can get away from the target, uh, the, the the better off you are. And then the wind, the wind comes through. It, 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 that's more of an operational measure. Um, if, if you're going to have different standoffs at different threat levels or, or other other types of conditions, and then also for external explosive threats, you have hand carried explosive threats uh, outside outside of the terminal. For internal, you have the same hand carried threats can also be brought in the terminal. You also have explosive devices detected at TSA screening checkpoints. And, and one of the issues with this is the extent of evacuation when explosive devices are, are detected. Um, shutdowns of, of airport terminals are costly. You have to shut, you know, all kinds of things down. And then afterwards, you have to get them uh, uh, back in operation again. And, and the, the question is, how, how much area do you really need to, to shut down? based off of an explosive charge size, uh, and how far do you need to get people away? And so you may not need to, to necessarily evacuate an entire terminal, just a, a portion of the terminal, but how much is that? And, and how far do you need to get the, 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 the people that are in the terminal, how far away do you, do you need to get them? Um, you're, you're looking at it as a function of human injury and damage. And also, too, you, you, you want to, on, on, on this, when you when the folks are evacuated, you don't want to necessarily evac evacuate them into higher risk areas than what you're evacuating them from. Um, if if, the, if there's an incident, um, and uh, yeah, because a lot of times folks when they come in a door and they have to evacuate, uh, they'll go back out the same door they they went through, even though it's not the safest or not even the the, 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 the closest one. Um, that that. If you go back to airlines on the um, on the, the pre-flight safety briefing, and they'll tell you, you know, look behind you, your closest exit may be behind you, and so it's just alerting people, hey, um, the, it, you know, going back through the door you came in may not be the the best option. And also, check baggage reconciliation rooms. We worked on uh, several of these as well for uh, for 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 um, bags that have. Uh, uh, detected explosives um, within. Looking at blast loading, um, we're going back to the discussion that, that we, we had a few minutes ago. Um, the, the, an actual uh, blast load from poten potential uh, or potential incident is generally unknown in advance. Um, the actual would likely be smaller or, or, or larger than the design basis threat. Um, the, the design basis threats are often based on a, a threat assessment, uh, intelligence, or or the historic precedent, um, uh, you know, just uh, trends um, of, of, of past incidents. And, and so you're, you're basically kind of, you know, kind of making an educated guess as to what the, the, the design threat should be. Um, you know, going back and looking at it, you know, in comparison with natural hazards, we're, I mean, granted, the past few years we've had uh, just uh, some incredible natural hazards, but in, uh, but in, in general, there we have a lot of documentation, a lot of, you know, we want to say bounds to, you know, kind of we know what to expect here. 
Um, and but the thing is, is you know, comparing natural hazards with these man-made threats, the natural hazards don't try to outthink you um, in terms of, of mitigation. And so that, 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 that's something that you, you always need to keep in, in the back of your mind when working on these types of projects. The design strategy focuses on mitigating hazards rather, rather than completely uh, eliminating them. That, that, that goes back to the, the function of cost and the level of risk acceptance because it's not practical to design for every possible scenario that, uh, that could ever happen. And then uh, design basis threat or blast load uh, frequently specified and is frequently specified in terms of explosive charge weight and standoff or peak positive pressure and equivalent linear duration. It's either one, one or the other that, uh, that is specified. The blast loads vary spatially across the facility. They vary both horizontally and vertically. If, if you look at the three figures below, um, you essentially see what the uh, uh, first one on the left here uh, with the package threat, you, you see the smaller range of uh, the, 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 the but smaller area that's affected, you move up to a small car bomb, it's, you, you get a lot more area affected in the truck bomb, you, you get significantly more um, area affected. And, it, you know, it goes back to with all else being equal, um, small bombs make small holes and large bombs make large holes. And then in evaluating these, we have two primary blast load components, a pressure, and, and uh, just to give you a, an idea of the magnitude that we're talking about, uh, most uh, standard structural design is designed in terms of pounds per square foot. With, but with blast loads, we design in terms of uh, pounds per square inch, which is, is, is you're not going to design typically for PSI in a, in a standard uh, structural design. Um, but for blast, that, that's, that's pretty much the norm. Um, you, you have reflected pressure, which is the pressure directly uh, that that's the, 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 it, that the blast wave is directly impacting, and you have the, the overpressure, which which is the, the standard measure of pressure, which impacts the, the, the sides and, and, and roof of the structures. And then you have uh, impulse, which is the total energy imparted to the system, which is a function of uh, pressure and, and duration. Uh, load duration on the structure. That, that, that's why we do, we can design for PSI because we're not designing for a static load. We're designing for a transient load with very short duration. And then also looking at the types of components that we're looking at. Some some components are pressure sensitive. Some are impulse sensitive. And and you need to have a, a good idea of that when when when, when evaluating these. Now, uh, an, an example. And, and actually, mass is very, very effective. Like I mentioned before, with 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 concrete, um, it, 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 the, the the mass plays a, 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 a crucial role in the in, in the performance. But uh, but but you, you can you can still, like I said, get get a lot out of standard building, um, just standard building components if designed in detail correctly. Uh, just an example I like to use to show the, the, the impact of mass in this type of environment um, and how mass is a benefit. If you take a, a golf ball and a ping pong ball and you place them side by side, they're both similar size, they're both you know, it's, you know, identical shape except for the pips and the, and the golf ball. And then, and then you pluck each one with your finger you're going to get two totally different responses. Uh, the ping pong ball is going to go flying across the room. The golf ball isn't, isn't going to fly nearly as much. In fact, you might hurt your finger trying to get it to move. But the thing is with the golf ball, once you get it moving, it's, 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 it's harder to stop um, just due to inertial effects. And so that's just a kind of an example of pressure sensitive versus impulse sensitive response on, on, on these systems. Some components just, uh, you know, go flying quickly and other ones it takes a while to, to get them moving. In fact, you may not, you may barely move them in, in a blast event um, before the blast load is off of the, the structure. Looking at exterior blast load environments, we, uh, first we're going to look at a, a Freelander waveform and, and that's a, that, that provides a good representation of uh, blast load time history. 
Um, and, and essentially here what we have, this is a blast load from one of our explosive tests. So you see the solid black line. We, we do a lot of explosive tests, so we have lots of data we can, we, we can work with on, on things like this. But, uh, but anyway, you can see up here we have a peak pressure, and this is a peak impulse. The impulse is a function of this area under, under the curve here. And, and when you start turning negative into, you go from a positive region down here to a negative region, your impulse starts to go down and then it, it essentially everything comes back to, to equilibrium here. And then, we, and then here's an example of a linear equivalent waveform. And, it, and it's a simplified approximation that's often used in blast design. It provides a really good representation, uh, get good enough to, to, to get you, you know, really close to, to, to where you need to be. And, um, and you can see, in, instead of having the smooth curve here, like in the Friedlander and the actual blast, uh, blast time history, you, you, you have just a triangular load here and, and, and triangular um, uh, functions, but you, you, you essentially, you still come back to, to equilibrium. For more complex load environments, computational fluid dynamics is sometimes used, but just due to the, it, its additional cost and it's expensive, so that, that's typically reserved for some you know, really complex geometries and specific conditions. Looking at the interior blast loads, you have the two load variables like we had discussed previously, air blast with both pressure and impulse, but with the, these two, you also have a, a, some internal reflection um, uh, that, that you have to account for within the space because you're working in a combined, combined, uh, confined space. And then you also have gas pressure buildup within the, within the space. And, and these types of, this, these are types of situations you'll find in screening areas, loading docks, um, reconciliation rooms and stuff where you, you don't have a lot, to, you, you're not in open air, so you're, you have a more confined uh, 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 the vent going on, and, and, and there's, especially when there's no venting involved. And he, here's an example here of a loading dock, and you can see uh, down here all of the additional peak, um, uh, it, um, you know, pressure um, pulses here. If we go back to the, the prior slide, um, you see it's rather smooth, but for internal here, we, we, we have these additional peaks. But anyway, Going back, uh, we, we have this long build up here on impulse, but essentially for an internal, it it it, it stays uh, on, on, it stays within the structure a lot longer than an external event. So you're going to have a longer time to reach the equilibrium. You're going to have more time for for these components to to, to respond, um, and then you also have you know higher loads just because of the increased uh, pressures and the gas pressure within the space. Uh, it, it, to, um, oftentimes, uh, in fact, most time anyway, uh, venting will help to relieve the internal pressure and, and, and reduce the impact of these. And, and as such, we often will design some uh, frangible elements in select areas as, as, as uh, blowout panels to help relieve pressure with, within these spaces uh, if, 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 if they're in locations that, that, that will allow for it. Some other site-specific variables that, that we often uh, work with here. One is environmental. Um, this has to do with, with elevation of the site, atmospheric pressure and temperature. For example, uh, you, you have two sites like, say, Cheyenne Mountain, Wyoming, or Cheyenne, um, it's not Cheyenne, Mountain, Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Gulfport, Mississippi. And you might have a 25% peak pressure reduction uh, in Cheyenne just because of the altitude difference uh, with all else being the same. Clearing, clearing is, is essentially how long the blast load stays on the structure. The, the faster the, 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 the load gets off the structure, the, 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 the less it will respond. And if you look down here, um, it, you, you essentially have uh, cleared, you have a 10 foot building and then a 24 foot building. Um, the, the solid red line is fully reflected. The, the dash blue line is side on, which is going to be your sides or your roof. But looking at the front face, um, the front face is fully reflected, infinitely large surface here. Um, a, and a, a clear, clear building for this 24 foot example is going to act. It, um, it, it's going to act as an infinitely large surface, just uh, you know, based on the, the conditions that we're looking at. But when you look at clearing for a smaller building 
with only 10 foot of surface area in the front rather than well, 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 the surface length in the front rather than 24 you can see you have a lower a lower peak pressure and then, and then also a lower negative pressure here just to, to show how how uh, how much it, how clearing will affect that and then here we, we have reflections on the structure or like, like I, I just discussed um, you can also have external reflections with you know, re-entering corners and, and, and things like that and then engulfment engulfment is is essentially when it's, it's kind of like clearing but it's, it's it's almost maximum clearing engulfment is where all sides are loaded almost simultaneously to where you get a very small net response on the structure and and it just uh it, it, an example i use is is because engulfment is, is basically you know you have atmospheric pressure and you have overpressure on the system but if you if you have like a, a, a can or a container and you submerge it under the sea and you look in all sides of the of the container you know collapse at, at once just due to the uniform pressure around the the, the, the canister that's pretty much engulfment and 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 you can it, Engulfed uh, structures or engulfed elements, well, you're not going to get a fully engulfed structure, but engulfed elements are because you get such a low net load with 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 load on the back countering the load on the front almost simultaneously, you can get hardly any, uh, we, we've had instances in, in testing where, where there, there, there was essentially no damage done to, to, to the component just because of the engulfment effect. And then we have shielding. Shielding is not a preferred design strategy. Um, the blast waves typically reform behind the, the the shield you put up, unless this unless it's designed and placed correctly. They can also turn into to a fragmentation hazard. Um, like an example I like to use for this is say you have a stream of water, and then you place something in the water uh, that, that obstructs the stream to a certain degree. And then essentially the, the, the wave will, will, will form, the, the, the fluid will continue to flow around that and, and then just reform on the other side. And it, because the, the, the blast wave essentially acts like a fluid where it'll, it'll go up, above and around the, whatever shield you put in front of it and reform on the opposite side to a certain degree. Um, it's all a function of, of uh, the size and, and distance between the, the, the shield and the protective facility. So. Uh, so, sometimes you can get full full reforming of the load behind the, uh, the wall. And then um, overly simplified load definitions for complex loads environments typically result in over or under or over design of components and systems. And, and we see this frequently. Just um, it, it, it people eat, it, uh, eat, you know, do different things and but we, we, we oftentimes encounter this. Okay, here, here, I'm going to go through some, some examples here, and um, it, these are several project examples. I, I was actually heavily involved in all of, all of these projects, just to demonstrate some, some of the, the, the methods that we used on, on these. And uh, the first one's Denver International Airport. Uh, this, this was actually a great airport to work with. We've worked on several projects with them over the years. Uh, they're, they're very proactive and very forward-thinking. Um, they're and we actually we, we perform the following services for them in terms of uh, in, in terms of blast. And um, the, the first one was a 1996 blast assessment of the new terminal when it first opened. Uh, the second one was a 2005 uh, an updated blast assessment for the new TSA requirements um, when when they came out. Um, then we did in 2005. We did glazing upgrade support. 2005. We also did a comprehensive physical security risk assessment. And then in 2014, we did the threat vulnerability and blast design for the um, for the STRP. That's essentially the, the expansion that expanded the the, 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 the terminal with the, with the new hotel and transit center and TSA screening and, and, and such. And I, I was actually the PI ARA PI for that that, that phase of the project. Okay, looking at modeling, we have, first of all, we developed a model, um, uh, ATSS or Global Blast model, uh, based on the design drawings uh, for the facility and uh, data collected during the on-site survey. And I actually did the, the on-site survey for this one. 
And then, um, and then what we did, we, we evaluated all the, the different areas of the airport there, well, the terminal for blast and the, and the AOV building um, to, but, uh, but, but a couple of the unique features that we, that we looked at specifically the tension, the tension fabric roof system, which it's a signature feature for this airport. Uh, it, it's a really, really nice, really unique structure. And so, what we did, we used our, our AT Assessor Global Blast model to determine the blast load distribution across the complex geometry of the roof system. From there, we developed a finite element model of the roof system, and, uh, and then we evaluated, and then we, we applied the load that we achieved, uh, obtained from the AT Assessor model, we applied it to the FBA model, and then uh, we evaluated the membrane response to the blast loads. And then we developed another FDA model of uh, the cable systems to, to evaluate the, the cable response under, under blast loads. Another feature here is the large south end curtain wall. It's a very large uh, curtain wall, multi-story curtain wall. Again, we, we developed uh, the loads from the AT Assessor Global Blast model. And then we applied the loads uh, to, the, to the FEA curtain wall model that we developed. Uh, this is an elevation model, of, of uh, an elevation view of the, the FEA model that we developed. And then it, here's a cross-section of the FEA model. And then we evaluated structural blast response and uh, developed upgrade recommendations for it. And then for the, for the STRP airport expansion, um, we, we, we took the original uh, AT Assessor Global Blast model that we developed and then we, we, we incorporated the additions into the, the model. And, and one of the unique features here we, we, we uh, evaluated was the, the uh, canopy and arch system for the outdoor plaza area and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the hotel. There. And, then, and then so we developed a finite element model uh, for these and evaluated them. For the, for the blast loads. We did the comprehensive physical security risk assessment where we looked at the complete airport perimeter, the main terminal building, airport operations building, concourses, fuel farm, air cargo area, and then developed security upgrade recommendations for each. Another airport uh, we, we, we worked on was Dallas Love Field here. Um, this is another great airport to work with. We worked with them twice, once uh, 2003 with the blast assessment of the existing terminal and then 2010 for the vulnerability and blast design for the modernization program. I uh, was the PI for this uh, 2010 effort. And then you can see down here lower right the, the AT Assessor Global Blast model. And and for this one here, we, we, uh, the blast design was for the constructed airport terminal. It included new ticketing, uh, check-in hall, expanded main lobby space, baggage claim, and comprehensive facade replacement. And then we worked with them to develop standoff requirements for planning the new parking structure as part of the, the phase two design. A more recent effort that, that, that we that we did here is uh, Trenton Mercer Airport in, uh, in Trenton, New Jersey, where we used the risk based the, the newer risk based approach uh, for for a new terminal building uh, being planned and uh, to, to replace the existing facility. Um, the threat rate rating received. Um, each threat received a rating for each of the following three risk factors, the nature of the threats, uh, potential consequence from a successful attack, and the vulnerability of the proposed facility to the threat. And essentially, th those are the three factors that, that comprise a risk assessment is uh, threat, uh, vulnerability, and consequence. Um, you know, those are for, uh, for risk, uh, security risk. And then we evaluated uh, the existing facility to determine likely vulnerabilities to the threats. These include evaluation of building response to explosive threats, uh, security screening, security lines of sight, and then planned operational and response procedures. And this is our last project here, the Phoenix Sky Harbor National Airport, the air traffic, air traffic control tower there. Uh, we provided blast design for the new FAA air traffic control pot tower and base building. We designed structural framing and building envelope systems for design basis explosive threats. They, they, this site had a, a constrained site with limited available standoff. Therefore, we had to, to, to beef up our design to, to, to account for this. And uh, like I mentioned before, with the, the horizontal and spatial um, 
extents of, of, uh, of blast loads, we, we, we had to um, consider both horizontal and vertically up the height of the tower, the, the blast loads, and uh, how the blast loads decrease as you increase up the height of the tower. And you can see our, our blast model down here um, in the lower right. So in conclusion, airports are critical facilities that require protection for many reasons. There are multiple layers for mitigating explosive threats at airports. Blast analysis and design requirements for mitigating these threats have evolved over time. And there are many technical factors involved with varying levels of complexity. Okay, Jerry, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Yes, the next slide, please, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Um, everybody, if you have questions now you and you haven't already submitted them, please do so. Uh, Ken will answer as many questions as time is available. He has provided his email address. However, due to the sensitive nature of his work, there may be some questions that Ken may need to decline answering due to security concerns, and certainly everybody appreciates that, hopefully. Next slide, please. Well, uh, first, before we get into Q&A, share with you some of the up and coming webinars in the near future. We currently have uh, presenters and dates booked through February uh, 2022. On September 22nd, we're going to, again, we try to provide a diverse suite of topics. All of our presenters are ARA employees. September 22, we're going to turn to the human factors of improving uh, human driver performance related to feedback. And that obviously has safety implications, uh, both from a soft side as well as a hard side. On October 27th, uh, we're going to hear from somebody I'm pretty familiar with, and that's myself. And Ken mentioned risk management quite a bit in his presentation. Risk, man risk management is pretty pervasive throughout science and engineering. I'll address risk management related to infrastructure and specifically the geotechnical engineering features, earthworks, structural foundations, retaining structures, et cetera, et cetera. So we have many more topics that we'll be covering with you. We tend, uh, those of you who've been with us for a while, recognize that hopefully we, sorry, we recognize that we bias our presentations toward the end of the month. Uh, we always have them on a Wednesday and uh, you can register and all of our programs are recorded. If you want to know how you can register, go to the website www.ara.com webinars and you'll find uh, information on the recordings as well as registration. Uh, next slide please, Kim. So we do have a number of questions and we've got a, a bit of time. The first question is from Carrie, Ken. And uh, Carrie has heard about glass window films. Could you explain briefly how these work? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Blast window films. Um, as I mentioned, the the, the you know other than beyond structural collapse, uh, hazardous window fragments are the second leading cause of, of casualties and fatalities in, in blast events. And so they, the blast window films started coming about in the in the in the late nineties and um to, to help mitigate uh, these hazards um it, it was seen in, in oklahoma city there, there, were, there were a lot of, of, of glass hazards and, and essentially what it is it's a win window film that, that you place on on uh, on, on the interior face of the window it's kind of like a car window tent but, but but these are heavy heavy mill heavy thickness um films that that aren't going to tear easily under under, under a blast event and, and you essentially you have three different types of applications where you have a daylight attached where you just you put film on and you cut it around the edges and and it, but in that, in that case it's it's the cheapest option but it it but the glass still enters the space but it enters and as a single unit uh the, as the film keeps the fragments together, and 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 it minimizes the the hazard. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you'll still get hit by a big piece of glass, but it won't be the the, the hazardous shards. 
<laughs> the second method is, is a wet glazed attachment where you put a, a silicone, a heavy duty structural silicone attachment around the perimeter of the windows to help retain the, the, the glass and the film in place. And then the third is to use mechanical attachment where you basically uh, use a batten bar and screw the the, 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 the film into place. The, the, the one issue with, with, with film is that films, they, is that they have a lifespan on them, uh, 15 to 20 years or so where the, the, you know, the warranty's up and, and and they'll start to, 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 to degrade. And, and so they will need to be changed at some point. Um, the, the preferable option, if you have a new window that you're putting in, is to use a laminate, um, similar to what's in your car windshield, where you have a, a, a thick uh, PVB layer in between the glass, uh, because the, the laminate is good for the life of the, of the glass, uh, unlike the film. OK, thanks, Ken. Sorry I interrupted you there. Um, Got a question from uh, Lori, and Lori's question is related to uh, if one's involved with planning a new project, when should the topic of blast protection be brought into the conversation? Uh, that, that, that would be as early as possible. Uh, if you can bring it in into the design concept where you're just kind of starting to sketch out ideas, that, that, that's the, 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 the ideal place because you can start getting uh, th these, th these mitigation measures built into the design. The farther, the farther you get down the path of design, the more expensive it's going to be. And the most expensive is once a, a facility is built, and then you have to go back and retroactively uh, in, incorporate the, 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 these provisions to meet a, a specific requirement. Okay, thank you. Uh, got a question from Ken, and um, his question is: Many airports have traffic barriers between the parking lots and the terminal. Are these effective at stopping glass? Uh, no, no, that, that, that goes back to the, the discussion uh, earlier on, on shielding. It, it's, it's essentially, the, the, the barriers aren't big enough and they aren't close enough to the terminal to really have any notable impact. The, the, the blast wave is just going to essentially go over and reform on the other side of the barriers. And if the threat is close to the barriers, it can fragment the barrier and, and create a, a fragment hazard as well. Okay, and we've got time for one more question, and it's an interesting question to, to conclude with. And this question is from Susan. Is it possible to outrun an explosion like we see in the movies <laughs> on our TV? Um, no, no, it, it, it's, it, it's not, it's, it's not possible. The, the, these events are measured in terms of milliseconds, and there, there's nobody that fast that's going to outrun an, an explosion like, you know, like you see on television. So yeah, that's, that's Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, that was a great question to conclude with. But unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. I want to thank everybody for their questions. And um, if you have, if we haven't managed to get to your questions, you can you can contact Ken during the next 24 hours. You have his email. And recognize what we indicated before. Due to the sensitive nature of his work, he may not be able to answer certain questions because of the confidential nature of the topic. So, uh, next slide, please. And just to remind everybody, everyone who's been able to attend for the entire hour, uh, I wanna, you're entitled to receive a one hour PPH certificate. So on behalf of ARA, I wanna thank you all for joining. Today's presentation, as I previously indicated, is being recorded. A link will be made available at the ARA Webinar Wednesday website early next week. I previously shared that with you and that's readily available. And uh, you also are entitled to receive, uh, even though you don't get a certificate if you signed up for a portion of the program, uh, a PDF copy of the presentation. Um, next slide, please. Now, ARA is a great company. Uh, as you probably have noticed, those of you have been on the monthly webinar program that's uh, approaching its third year of presentations, only one every month. All of our presenters are ARA employees. It's a great company, 35 plus offices, 1,500 plus people. So if you're interested in learning more about potential employment opportunities, go to the website that you see here. You can look at um, provide a brief resume and some information 
and we'll see if we have a good cultural match with your interests and our needs at a given time. I want to thank you all again for joining today's program. May God bless you and God bless America. Thank you again, Ken. All right, thank you.